Please feel free to follow along as I read Jeremiah 8 through chapter 9, verse 1. Listen to the word of the Lord. My sorrow cannot be healed. I am sick at heart. Listen, throughout the land I hear my people crying out. Is the Lord no longer in Zion? Is Zion's king no longer there? The Lord, their king, replies, Why have you made me angry by worshiping your idols and by bowing down to your useless foreign gods? The people cry out, The summer is gone, the harvest is over, but we have not been saved. My heart has been crushed because my people are crushed. I mourn, I am completely dismayed. Is there no medicine in Gilead? Are there no doctors there? Why then have my people not been healed? I wish my head were a well of water and my eyes a fountain of tears so that I could cry day and night for my people who have been killed. The word of the Lord. Let's pray, friends. <clears throat> Thank you, God. Thank you that today, in your word, you were vulnerable with us. You opened up to us a glimpse of how it is you feel when you look upon your creation. This might set us back. This might surprise us. This might make us realize how unprepared we are to have a mutual relationship with you where there is give and take as opposed to us just siphoning off from you. Instead, you have given us a tremendous responsibility, an opportunity today, God, to consider with compassion how we affect you. Help us to take these words in, Lord. Help them to move our hearts and our spirits so that we might know you more deeply and love you more dearly. We pray, God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we are ready to accept this challenge and to learn and grow from it for your glory and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> This passage is officially known as a lament. It's the stuff that we usually kind of like try and stay away from, especially on Sunday morning, because we want to come here and feel good when we worship the Lord, right? We came to get like filled up. We came expecting something to shake off maybe the wounds and the slings and arrows of this previous week and for God to come and do something for us. Instead... Your stinking pastor gives you these words from Jeremiah that are so troubling. If we were to read the verses before this, you'd really be bummed out because it talks about the destruction that the people have experienced that led Jeremiah to say these things. Lord, where are you? Is there no longer a king in Zion? How long will these people have to be hurt and destroyed and suffer, God? So I pick the easier of the hard part. Hopefully that's okay for you all. But as we read through this and we think about the things that we have suffered, the struggles in our own lives, the state of the world, it is easy for us to blame God. It's easy for us to look around at tragedy and loss and destruction and to blame God for these things. In the context of the people who are hearing Jeremiah's words here, that was the common belief, in fact. When something bad happened, it equaled God's punishment. And so they are reasoning here. They are experiencing that because they have done something wrong, God is punishing this people mightily. It's easy then for us to weep and wail and moan at the lot in life that we have, at all the bad things, and to feel sorry for ourselves. How often, though, when we look at the state of the world, when we contemplate tragedy and loss and grief, how often do we stop and say, God, how does this make you feel? How are you feeling, God? I really love this image because it had the broken heart, but also because it has the broken heart made from clay. 
Remember, Jeremiah is the same um, book in the Bible where God talks about how we are the clay and God is the potter. What does it do when the creation breaks? How does that make the creator feel? What of the heartbreak of our creator when the creation, the clay, disobeys, falls away, lashes out, rebels, disbelieves, finds fault? Did we ever think that God maybe had feelings? In our own grief, we lose sight way too easily that God's heart is broken too. Today is the last day of summer. My daughter wore a sleeveless jumper. I don't know. I'm not sure what the correlation is there between those two things, but fall is upon us. Lest we mourn too selfishly about the loss of this season, let's spend some time today looking at the one who spins the globe to move us from one season to the next. Let's ask ourselves, how does God feel when God sees the world? If we were to keep reading ahead in chapter 9 of Jeremiah, we would see that while the seasons may change, we don't. And we would hear why God's heart is so broken. So the last day of summer. This is actually the title of a really good book that I read uh, a few years ago. Baseball fans in the house today? Any baseball fans? You might want to read this book. It's really good. You have read it? I have it. Oh, okay. Well, very good. Then, then borrow it from her. She hasn't read it already. Right. It's, it's what you call an epistolary. It's written through letters. And it's the story of this little boy who is trying to con a professional baseball player into hitting a home run for him. And we find out that the little boy comes from what we'd call like a broken home. And he is looking for his own identity in the world. So he's latched onto this ball player. And they develop this great relationship. But the story takes place on the eve of World War II. And so throughout the whole book, there is this ominous feeling that something is going to go wrong. After all, it's called The Last Days of Summer. I won't give any spoilers because I'm hoping that maybe you'll read it because it's a quick read because it's told all through letters and telegrams and newspaper articles. It's really brilliant. But it's a story of the boy's loss of innocence and how things happen that challenge him and yet this boy has an indomitable hope that is able to not just persevere through the tragedy but embrace the tragedy and give it a hug filled with hope so that he can lament and at the same time celebrate a faith that says there is more than just this loss. So we too as we listen to these words from Jeremiah we too have a choice. We can look at the world and we can see only its brokenness and despair. We can allow ourselves to be overcome by the anger and the enmity and the violence and the selfishness and think that that's all there is. And we can proclaim that this is either God's punishment or God's absenteeism. And that's just the state of the world. We can allow this to cause us to wither away like the dying leaves of the plants at the end of summer and to see only the setting of the final summer sun, knowing the days are growing shorter and the nights longer and darker, and see only loss. We weep with Jeremiah as we read his words, and we think about the world that we see. I love the imagery in verse 9-1, where he talks about, if only my head were a well of tears. <laughs> We get the sense that he cannot possibly weep enough to fill bucket upon bucket upon bucket of grief and sadness because of what he is seeing captures a certain catharsis to our need to weep, to the capacity with which God has built us in order to be able to weep. But in case we go too far, we don't want to allow that loss to be so overwhelming that we can't come back from that. We live in a world where things happen so fast, don't they? And we have this ability to see on a global scale what is happening. I confess, in moments of tragedy when there is like a school shooting or some unspeakable violence, I, um, 
I'm sort of like in shock at the actual moment when it happens, but then I'll be like, you know, working on a Bible study or I'll listen to a song or, or maybe I'll just, I like see or hear my kids playing in the basement or I'll see like a couple walking hand in hand and I'll just start crying and I'll immediately go back to that thing that I had like packed deep down inside because it was such a weighty, tragic loss. I, I couldn't emotionally experience at that moment because my head is just trying to get around the, the things that happened in this world and the way then that we respond to it or fail to respond to it. And this, this grief just comes up out of me. And this passage from Jeremiah speaks so clearly to how I'm feeling. There is this immense sadness, and I can't possibly feel all of it at once. So it's portioned out over time. Does this happen to anybody else? That you just This grief just hits you, and you're like, man, where is this coming from? We learn to carry it, and I think it puts us in this like emotional paralysis that we hold on to it and we don't learn how to let it out or how to use it as an inspiration to move forward from it. But just these waves of grief just hit us. And yet here, here in this ancient text, older than all of us combined, it tells that this harshness of the world is not something in just our 21st century context. It is something that has existed. And so, as I think of God's heartache, witnessing this creation in this world, it does make me wonder a little bit. Even as I'm giving you a sermon about God's grief, I have to add a little levity because it's just it's too much. And I'm watching your faces just get longer and longer. And that's kind of the effect I wanted you to have. So this is to soften the blow. But I, how do we mend God's broken heart? Can we even do that? Do we even have the capacity, the ability to do that? Boy, Adam, geez, slow down, would you? I wasn't even thinking about how God feels. And now you want me to fix how God feels, too, on top of it? Yeah, life moves fast in Faith United Presbyterian Church. <laughs> in our own sadness, to avoid ourselves from feeling too gratuitous and selfish in it, Let's be mindful that our God is feeling that sadness as well. As we ask the question, can God feel sadness? The answer is beyond all our sadness. Yes, God feels it and more so. It breaks God's heart. We might want to believe that these are just manifestations of God's anger and punishment or worse, absenteeism. But instead, I want to encourage you to realize that God cares so deeply about the things that we do that wound ourselves, that wound one another. And it breaks God's heart. Lewis Stolman, who's a theologian that provided a commentary on this passage, says, Does God lament because of the terrible suffering the people are experiencing? Or is God lamenting because the people have wandered so far? The two can't be easily separated. God weeps day and night for their wounds and... God weeps day and night for the list of the people's transgressions. This is a great hinting at God's deep pain. A deep pain at our actions, our choices, the course that we have all walked. I have an even older song. Al Hibbert wrote a song called He. And he, in, the, in the song, he talks about God is the he, of course. Um, and he talks about all the wonderful things that God has done in creation. But the chorus of the song is, though it makes him sad to see the way we live. And that just gets me every time. That, that deep sadness that God has. 
Now, we cry out. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no healing? Is there no method? God's crying. We're crying. And we all want to know, is there any way to make this better? Is there no balm in Gilead? But wait. Wait a minute. There is, isn't there? God didn't just give up. God doesn't just give up. In fact, we, through the Gospel of God, John, can trace back that even before all of creation began, God had provided the balm already. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God set it up. God made the balm even before the illness had happened. And what's the name of that balm, my friends? He's got a last name too, right? Jesus Christ. That's the balm that God had provided for us even before we had the ailment. Even before the world began, even before creation had started, that word was with God. And how does God provide the healing? I love the way John writes it. The word. God just speaks and the healing is there. Now, now we come to the way that we get to help heal God because we are the torchbearers of this word. We are the song singers of this glorious hymn that God has written. We are the prophets of his resurrected ministry. There is a balm in Gilead and it works for the Middle East and it works for Chicago and it works for our broken hearts and that balm is Jesus Christ. The next line in the song, he, after he says, though it makes him sad to see the way we live, he'll always say, I forgive. And through Jesus Christ, God continues to forgive. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But believe it, we must. That is the very nature of our faith. That is why the last day of summer is the perfect day the perfect way to think about this hurt that God experiences. The perfect way to describe what Jeremiah is talking about here. Because we lament that the long days are going away. And we feel that cold death of winter creeping in on the edges just a little bit. Yet, before we get to that moment in winter, there's a whole other season, isn't there? And in that season of autumn, there is a harvest. This is when the fruits have come to fruition. But we have to experience just a little bit of that loss. We have to say goodbye to summer if we're going to be able to fill our arms with the fruits of the harvest. Before we can gather that in, we have to leave off something else. And so even as we walk the dusty roads of destruction, we can see heaven's hopeful reflection shining down and bouncing back up into our eyes. Even though our God weeps, we feel comfort. Even though summer is going, going, gone, what comes at the end? The harvest. The harvest that God has for us. So it isn't all loss. It isn't all loss. Allie Hutley explains that within loss, especially within our weeping constantly, like described in verse 9-1, we are able, through our faith, to, to sustain a desire to overcome it. To want there to be a healing and to fight back against the tide that seems to say that there is only loss. It will happen again and again. And it makes our pain and our tears seem like listless drops of water. But through our faith, through hearing Jeremiah's cries, we can feel the people's loss and be moved by God's sadness so that we might remember. So that our lament might actually transform from the sad days of lost summer to a hope-filled harvest season that is yet to come. But unlike the calendar, when these pages don't turn automatically, we don't just give up. We can continue to lament with God and work the harvest until they do. 
There is a sickness of our hearts and a sorrow that feels like it can't possibly be healed. But also we know there is a balm in Gilead. And he has empowered us to a ministry of compassion, restoration, and hope until he comes again to wipe away every tear. Until then, we will weep with sadness, but also we will walk and work with our God for the harvest. Amen? Amen. 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 As you pass the peace, I encourage you to take a glimpse at these words and be reminded that at the same time God has a brokenness of heart, that our hearts can ache and break with our God, and that is how we heal together. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. I encourage you to share that peace now. Peace. Yeah, that was nice.